Well, where are we today, Bill? <laughs> well, today, Rick, we are in Kings King Kingston, New Hampshire. Kingston, right. Kingston yep. New Hampshire. And we are in the Greenwood Cemetery. Okay. And we are here to visit a rather famous couple, New Hampshireites. Um, this is Barney Hill and um, Betty Hill. Okay, yep. And as it says underneath their names on their stones, of the interrupted journey. And anyone who is a fan of UFOs or a believer in UFOs will certainly recognize the story of Betty and Barney Hill. I think it is one of the most famous stories, isn't it? It is, and it was one of the, the first stories, and it was the first story of a documented close encounter, if you will. Of the third kind. Yes, right? as they were, they claimed to be abducted by aliens. Yep. Extraterrestrials, if you will. Uh, it's, an inter it's a fascinating story. Uh, they were on kind of a second honeymoon or, or a romantic trip to Canada. They went to Montreal and yeah. Quebec. And on their way home, uh, they came through New Hampshire, down through the White Mountains. And they were just, just about to uh, Cannon Mountain, where the old man of the mountain stood. Yep. And suddenly they, uh, they realized that there was a light in the sky and it, they actually saw the object uh, pass over the old man of the mountain, which must have been quite, quite interesting, quite a romantic interesting, picture if yeah, you think yeah, about it. Yeah. Um, in any event, the light seemed to get closer and closer and they suddenly discovered that they were being followed. And they, they had their, their uh, little dog with them, whose name was Delcy. It's D-E-L-S-E-Y. I hope I pronounced that right. Yeah, Delcy. sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like all dogs on a long trip, the dog needed to, <laughs> yeah, to be relieved. And so they stopped, and at which point the light was right in front of them. And they looked, and suddenly that road was actually blocked by the alien craft. And here's where it gets interesting because they, 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 they continued on their way home to port. They lived in Portsmouth and they were on their way right. home and they yeah. continued on the way. Well, when they arrived at Portsmouth, they had no recollection of why it took, it was like six hours, what should have been a four hour oh, drive. Yeah. Yep. Uh, they, they just had no recollection whatsoever. It happened to them. And then they started, both of them starting to have reoccurring dreams. Dreams, yeah, I heard about, about that. About yeah. the abduction. Yeah. And uh, eventually, they they actually reported the incident to the Air Force, because they're yeah. very close to Pease Air Force Base, and uh, they reported it, and they were interviewed for the Operation Blue Book. Yeah. And they took them serious, and uh, but what happened was they had these reoccurring dreams and they couldn't really account for that lost time, hence the interrupted journey. And they, someone suggested that they go under hypnosis. Hypnosis, yeah. And they that. did. And amazingly enough, they did under hypnosis recall the story in great detail. And their stories were almost identical. There were some differences, but very few. And they remembered being on the ship. They remembered uh, being probed. They did uh, medical exams on them. And uh, they remembered this in great detail, including a, a which, uh, Betty was shown a map of the stars. Yeah. And she drew it from memory. And later on, of course, the story was that nobody knew what it you know, reflected at the time. But later on, with newer uh discoveries, they found that the match was almost identical to another solar system that we now know about. Right. So, and this is a conjecture, of course, and, you know, but. Well, I think I read that, that also the way that the map showed this planet that they apparently were trying to say they were from, it was the, the perspective would have been different because it was done, you know, from a different, not from Earth, yes, but from another, you know. So yes. obviously, it would look different. That right, way. the sun was in the wrong place, as I understand it, because yeah. they were looking at it from a different perspective. Exactly. Yeah. Now, um, 
what, what, what after these, these interviews, the, uh, the hypnosis, uh, they got discovered. Yes. <laughs> Up until this point, they, both, neither one of them made any attempt to uh, pu get any publicity about this. They, they didn't, you know, seek the public eye at all. And then, lo and behold, these tapes got released to a reporter uh, <clears throat> uh, from the Boston Traveler. And he did a front page story in the Boston paper and the Traveler yeah. about the incident. And then it, the, the story was seized upon the famous John Fuller, who wrote a numerous different stories about aliens and space travel, etc. And <clears throat> he called it, the name of the book was The Interrupted Journey. Yep, very appropriate. Yep, very, it was a great name. And it was a huge success. It's, I think it's obviously still in print, probably. Yep. But it's been in several printings. And this, this occurred in 1966. Yep. And when the book came out, yep, and it was a huge success. And I remember I was in a freshman in college at the time, and it was very popular among uh, students in my dorm. <laughs> Thought this was pretty amazing because I was in school in New Hampshire, and we weren't that far away. And it was, yep. you know, a very interesting story. Actually, to tell you the truth, I think I read that way back when. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. I, I, a I read of interest it there. Yeah. You know, especially because they were from New Hampshire. Yes. So yeah. it was. You know, and then shortly exciting. thereafter, the famous incident in Exeter occurred. That was you know, a year or so after that. The actual date was the night of September 19th and 20th, 1961. Yeah. And we are standing here on September 9th. 9th, 2024. So it was 63 years ago, almost to the day yep. that this happened. And both Rick and I know the White Mountains of New Hampshire and traveled Route 3 numerous times, been through there at night, and coming down through the notch there is, can be quite spooky. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, it's hard to drive by there in that general area, and there is a poster, a marker there, yes. state marker that says this is more or less where it happened. Um, but you drive down through there, and yet I, at least I have since we sort of more since we started looking into this for mm -hmm. our book. But my feeling is like, oh wow, what what did that look like? Yeah. Driving down through there. Well, there's a big difference now. It's actually a four-lane highway, but as anybody who's ever traveled it you know, recently knows that it narrows right down yeah. and goes, you know, very narrow notch, and it goes it's all downhill, and you can, you know, Cannon Mountain is up on your right if you're going south. And, uh, of course, the old man, a mountain who is gone now, you occurred as you got past Cannon right. Mountain. You could see it from the road. And back then, it was just a two-lane highway. Yep. Yeah. And today, of course, it's four lanes, but it's still very narrow. But that, then it was just a two-lane high. I and mean, they were, at that time of night, they were the only people on the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I've had that experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, interesting, though, you bring up a canon because I have, I remember reading a part of a, a section somewhere that one of the people who doesn't, who don't believe, somebody that, doesn't believe all of this, yeah. or, or or feels maybe that they were mistaken. That's a better way to put it. Is that there is apparently a beacon on on uh, on yes. on uh, Cannon Mountain uh, that resembles what they describe. Yes. Um, but well, they noted, I believe, that the the restaurant was lit up. The yeah, restaurant okay. on the top of the ski mountain, Cannon Mountain, and they they mentioned it, and then the lights went out. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's it's certainly one of those things that it's hard to prove really one way or another. I think personally, though, it's really interesting that they didn't seem to want to promote it at the beginning. I mean, it wasn't like they came back and said, oh, this is a great way to make some money. Yes. Uh, they didn't seem to have that kind of motivation, no. And I, I think Barney, in particular, even resisted, at, especially at the beginning, wanting to have any of this out. It's, and, it's really important to note, too, that Barney, in particular, they, they were a mixed-race couple. That's correct, yeah. 
and he was a black man and he was very prominent in New Hampshire civil rights yeah. work. And that was, of course, in the early 60s, the uh, civil rights era, uh, the protests, and et cetera. And he was very active and he didn't want this to show any reflection upon him being an honorable, honest man, <laughs> which he was. Yeah. There was no I question he was, and, Be and Betty too. Yeah, no, she was a social worker. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now they were both well-educated. Yeah. And had to, he was worked for the post department yeah. and postal department. And, uh, you know, they both had, you know, were respected in, in their community. And uh, it, it's interesting to note that the University of New Hampshire has their papers. <laughs> and most <laughs> unusual of all, Betty was wearing a blue dress yep. the night of the abduction. And it was kind of torn up. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were rips in it. I've seen photographs in it. The hem was ripped. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, damage done to it. Yeah. You know, apparently, and, and that she had no recollection of how, how she certainly would not have ruined a good dress. Um, yeah. You know? um, so just to, just to point out the, the story. But yeah. uh, yes, if you, you can, I guess you can view this at the library in their, in their historical collection at the University of New Hampshire. You can, you can view Betty's dress that she was wearing the night of the abduction. Well, very definitely an interesting story that carries on to this day. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, I think it was only a week or two ago that the, the whole group of people that celebrate UFOs and so on in New Hampshire uh, did that. Yeah, well, uh, that's uh, the, the, the Alien Festival. In the Exeter, Alien and, Festival, yeah, yeah. Which I have attended with my grandson a couple of times. It's <laughs> no, a wonderful never festival have. if you've never been. <laughs> and, and young kids like he was then, yeah. very young. He enjoyed it immensely. And, and, and there was a lot of activities for, for children and, you know, yeah. kind of a playful thing. But then a, guest speakers come and yeah. there's a more serious side for those that, that you know, are interested in alien abductions and that sort of yeah. thing. So they, it's actually quite a, a conference. And, and Betty actually, it, uh, <clears throat> Barney, as you can see, died in 1969. He, yeah. he died shortly after the incident. And Betty died in 2004. And for a long time, she, she did. She didn't really profit, but she attended a lot of these conferences and she freely spoke about it. Yep. And uh, whereas they, in the beginning, they were rather reluctant about it. But Apparently. On, yep. She did. So. Well, oh. I hope they are resting in peace. Yes. <laughs> um, very yeah. definitely an interesting story. Yeah. I, I think they were, you know, a very, very, uh, you know, warm people you would have probably wanted to meet and, yeah, and enjoyed talking to them too. I, I, I really get that feeling about them. Yep. And, uh, so, I, you know, yes, I hope they're resting in peace and they're, they're free from abductions. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so.